race was sort of, you know, slavery in America, and now it's gender. That male, the male gender has more of a slave state, and it's because men are now subjugated to the law and to women. When Welcome to the Father State. I am Destiny Peterson. Click on the uh, Patreon link to uh, support our work. I'm talking with an amazing person today. Her name is Dr. Helen Smith. She's a psychologist and a blogger on PJ Media. She has a book that you gotta read for everybody and their mama. Men on Strack. Why men are boycotting marriage, fatherhood, and the American dream, and why it matters. Dr. Smith, thank you so much for coming on. I'm looking forward to speaking with you about this. Jesse, thank you so much for having me on today. I look forward to it too. <laughs> Amazing. I was, my producer introduced me to your videos and I was really just, you're the first woman that I ever, I've seen since I was a child who really are honest about, is honest about what's happening with men today. How what you, video did you watch that you thought was so, uh, what caught your eye? There was, uh, there was like a bunch of them, you were doing different interviews on different mm -hmm. networks, Fox News and other networks, and your honesty about what's happening to men was amazing to me. Okay. Um, how did you, oh, one thing I wanted to ask you about, you said that you were a feminist at one point, right? Right. And what does that mean to be a feminist to you? What, would you? what was that like for you? Being a feminist to me always meant that men and women were equal. I was a, very much an egalitarian. Like when I was a kid, I really felt like women and men should have equal rights. And as I got older, and especially in the last, say, 20 years, what I realized is that women have special rights and privileges and men have responsibilities. And I think things have changed so much over the years where men are getting such a raw deal. And now women, everything in our culture, everything in our um, politics is about women and what women need. And yep. what we've done is we've neglected what men need. How did that happen? Because I don't think a lot of men and maybe even some women saw that coming. How did it happen where it's just so one-sided right now in favor of the woman? Um, I think that just women's groups and the politicians, I think women, you know, they want votes and women have a lot of, of uh, sway there. So I think women, uh, you know, men, male politicians really, in order to get those votes, have to pander somewhat to women and also just the groups and the constant um, change over time. I think it sort of just switched from everything being, and I don't think everything was about men, but I think a lot of things were. And I think that the change just happened gradually through the 60s, through the 70s, through a lot of things, even things like the self-esteem movement where people are constantly thinking that they're supposed to be entitled and have all these things. And I think particularly we feel that way about women. When you talk to women, they feel they have a very big sense of entitlement. I deserve the man that I want. I deserve all of the things that I want. And men are just taught in our society not to want things. And I think it's just sort of this flip, reverse discrimination that's happened over the past 40 or 50 years. Amazing. I do a radio show and I deal with men issues. And there was a man called in the other day. He went to a Trump rally and President Trump asked, should I replace the Supreme Court seat with a man or a woman? And the president said, who all think I should replace the seat with a woman? And, and a whole bunch of people went, yeah, a woman, a woman. Right. And then he asked, how about a man? And barely anyone spoke up. And so he was afraid to applaud for a man because he felt that people would attack him if he said a man should take the seat for the Supreme Court justice. And I thought that was very interesting that he was afraid to speak up, even in that way, for a man. Men are so afraid, and I think that's why I wrote the book, Men on Strike. I wrote it because men are afraid to speak up, and the only one, the only uh, person anyone will listen to now is a woman. It's like women have authority over gender, and somehow, when you ask how did this happen, I think what happened is that somewhere along the lines, women 
um, started talking about gender, writing about gender, and men got pushed out of it, and they don't speak up because like this man at the Trump rally, they're afraid. They'll yeah. be attacked. They'll be slandered. Uh, who knows what could happen? They could lose their job. You never know. It reminded me of white people in America today. They are mm -hmm. afraid to say, I'm not a racist. I'm not your problem if it's concerning black people. And as a result of being afraid to speak up, black people, not all, but most, have gotten worse rather than getting better. They feel so entitled now that they're trying to take it by force because no one spoke up and said, hey, your issue is about family. In America, you can do what you want. And so now white people admitted that they are racist and all kind of crap. And I see that starting to happen to men because they have not spoken up. Men don't speak up, and I think they're starting to. I do see that a little bit more. Remember, I wrote this book. I wrote it in 2013, and different copies have come out. We've done a paperback. There's been an audio book. And it was actually hard. Uh, there were a lot of places that didn't want to publish it because they said men aren't even interested in a self-help book. And I was like, no, they are. They are interested. And they are interested. And men are speaking up. And yeah. you see a lot of men, men used to speak up a lot on the internet. And I think they are starting to speak up because more and more men understand the raw deal that is against them in the courts, in marriage, in the legal system. And I, I, I agree with you. I think that I think it's particularly the liberals, and it's not just liberals. Conservatives are just almost yeah. as bad. Yes. Yeah, there are a bunch of white nighters who go around trying to protect women and giving women all these special privileges like alimony, you know, get the kids, all kinds of things. And I think the biggest thing is that people have to form more of a group. One of the things is you have to understand it's psychological, and men are afraid to speak up because they're used to fighting maybe a war or something happening, but they're not used to fighting women or families. You know, that's a hard, hard thing to do. I agree. So let me ask, are you a feminist now or are you done with that? No, when people say what, when they ask me, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, are you done with that? I mean, I believe, I believe in equal rights for men and women, but I, when people ask what I do, I just yell, I'm a men's rights activist, mainly just to piss them off. <laughs> So you work with men in your practice for over 20 years. Yes. Um, was there one particular thing that got your interest? You're like, wow, I had no idea it was this bad. What yes. were you hearing? hearing? Yes. I, there was one situation when I first started out. I worked in New York. I had a private practice in my early 20s. And one of my first patients was a man in a wheelchair and he had a wife who was this tall woman and she would uh, abuse him or beat him or verbally abuse him. And at that time, like there was no help anywhere for an abused man. And I realized at that time, you know what, there more men need help because there is no, you know, women have all these women's centers or, you know, centers for people to go who are physically or mentally abused, but men really don't have any place. Even today, it's, there's very rarely a place that you could go. Yeah. Um, how did women convince men that it's okay to let them smack on them, knock them out or slap them or curse at them in public and just treat them any kind of way with no response? Because that would never happen to me. I tell them, I believe in self-defense. And if Good. you don't think you could beat me, you better not hit me. I don't care if you're male or female. Yeah. How, how did they convince men to let women do that to them? Well, I don't think, you know, there's always sort of been a thing about don't hit a girl. I think what's happened is as women, the same women actually like that kind of uh, chivalry. So men still have this thing like they're not going to hit a woman. No, men don't, you know, and, and <laughs> I don't think it's good to hit anybody except in the self Right. I mean, yes. It's unfortunate. I, I really don't think it's a good thing. I mean, if you're getting to the point where you're hitting a, your domestic partner, things are not going well for right. you. Um, but um, I don't think it's that they convinced them. I think men still are taught in our society to keep that chivalry going while at the same time, women, as they've gotten more and more power, and there are no consequences. The laws have changed so that, you know, you look at things like the Me Too movement or even before that. I mean, it's if you're a man and you touch a woman, you're going to jail, you know. And I've heard from so many men, particularly minority and African-American men. A lot of them I have literally had had clients who um, 
you know, who have been in jail for, you know, whether that be child support or even a false allegation that they hurt or touched a woman. And I think that the laws are such that men are in hot water if they do something that a woman accuses them. When I was growing up, I grew up with a bunch of sisters and brothers, but a lot of sisters. And as kids, if one of my female cousins or my sisters should hit me, we would hit back and they would go crying to my mother. And right. she, she, would say, she would say, well, you should not have hit him. Of course he's going to hit you back. But we well, weren't you had a taught, really good mother. Yeah, we weren't taught to be violent, you know. But if somebody hits you, you got to protect yourself. Um, and so we were naturally taught to be that way. But men today are taught by their mothers, if their sister hit them, don't hit back. So it's kind right. of being taught in the homes as well, from what I hear. Well, I think that, you know, probably boys have always been taught, you know, women aren't as strong. I mean, probably it's not a good idea to hit them. But <laughs> I do think women, I think the difference is that women feel very free today. Yes. Again, there are no consequences. It's like your mom got on the sister, so they probably didn't hit you. Today, if you want, if a woman smacks you in the face and you're a man, if you try to do anything or self-defense, you, you will be the one going to jail or being accused. Um, one of the things that research finds is that most violence between couples is reciprocal. In other words, the woman hits the man usually first, then yeah. the guy retaliates, and then he's the one that ends up in trouble. Absolutely. I've also heard cases from men that if the wife get mad at them, or she wanted something, couldn't get it. She would lie and say that he hit her, he was abusive, and mm-hmm. nothing happened, but because she said it, he have to go to jail or leave his home. Oh yeah, that's a very, that's not that uncommon. And women know now that they can call the police anytime for anything. I talk to men, especially military men, and they'll tell me like, women will do all kinds of them for, things to them, and you know, girlfriends will come and attack them, I talked to one man who said a girlfriend came to his house. He was having a party and she jumped in and hit him and stuff. And he ended up when the police came, they tried to handcuff him. Um, But that's just the way it is. The police. And if you read literature, even on, you know, like with the police or any kind of domestic violence, it's always the man is the perpetrator and the woman is the victim. Always. Yeah. You make the point that men used to be rewarded for being men, but now they are punished. What do you mean by that? It used to be that men actually got something out of marriage. They were respected. And you were seeing if you were a father or a husband, you were respected. And now the rewards for marriage in in the culture is just so low. There are no, there just aren't a ton of rewards, at least legally. Certainly, you know, you get companionship and all kinds of things, but you can have those with a relationship. The rewards for men in marriage are just very, very poor. Men can have their kids taken from them. They 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 pay alimony ninety seven percent of the time. Um, the cards are stacked against them when it comes to marriage. If the marriage breaks up, I have been telling men lately because I've heard so many horror story stories that if you have to break up, divorce or whatever, and the woman take you to court mm-hmm. uh, and tell the judge, hey, I don't want him to see this child or 50-50, whatever. I'm telling men not to even bother to go to court and waste their money because a lot of time if they do get visitation rights, uh, the woman still dictate when they can see them, where they can see them, where you can take them, where you cannot take them. So it's still a lot of problems because she's not going to follow the court orders. So I'm telling men to just save their money buy some land, prepare themselves, so when the kids grow up, eventually the kids may look for the fathers and they'll be ready for them rather than wasting their money in courts. Am I wrong with that advice? Yeah, um, I actually interviewed men for my book. And one thing I have to point out is it's a lot of this is psychological. They actually find that most of the time men do not get custody of their kids. Right. Uh, only about, uh, you know, cu- custodial fathers are about 17%. But one of the major reasons is that men will not fight back. Those that do, they often, not often, but many times can get partial custody at least, and they can fight for that. Most men walk away because they think that's the right thing to do. Um, I get what you're saying. I think after a certain point, yes, you might want to 
pack it in. <laughs> but I think my advice would be rather than, you know, people, men, it's hard to walk away from your children. It is. You have to get yourself a really good lawyer and you have to fight. And I know people who do that and they actually win. So it is possible. But and once they get the kids uh, visitation rights, they still got to fight with the mother mm -hmm. to see the child and what time and who you can be with or not be with. She still make it difficult for the fathers to see the children. She can make it difficult, but the man can also make it difficult. I've, I've worked with men and I've met men who have made it difficult. I don't think anyone should make it difficult. These are your kids. That's it would be right. better if people can get along yeah. and do the right thing. But I get what you're saying when that doesn't happen. It's easy to just throw up your hands and go on strike and say, but you know, you got to think about when kids are in the equation, I think fighting for your kids and not again, that psychological barrier against a fight, get the best lawyer you can afford. Uh, if you have to go get a GoFundMe, do something to raise some money, get yourself a lawyer and fight. Um, there are men, there are um, attorneys now, there are more and more attorneys, if you actually look on the internet, who are working with men specifically um, on these issues, and some of them are very, very good. But the courts, are, the judges are against the men as well. So even if you got a good lawyer, that lawyer have to fight with that judge not only against the woman's lawyer, but also with the judge. And a lot of times the judges are, for, are not for the men. A lot of times they're not, but believe it or not, sometimes there are actually female judges. You would think it would be the opposite, but sometimes they are more sympathetic to men. And I think that, that a little bit of that is changing, not very much, but I think it's still worth the fight. Mm -hmm. And um, if that judge isn't right or is going to, you know, then maybe you can get an appeal or do something. <laughs> yeah. But I, I know I've worked in juvenile court for many, many years. I, I did a long time ago. And I know that sometimes men definitely could could get custody of the kids. So like I said, do fight. If you if it doesn't work out, then maybe that's time to resort to going to get you in your land and just staying the heck with it. But yeah. not until then. Men and women, when they fight, the fight is between the father and the mother. It has nothing to do with the child at all. Both parents love the child. Yes. What is it about the mother that will want to take the child away from the father, turn the children against the father, and create more problems for the children? What type of, what's wrong with her that she would do something like that to I the don't children? Think I don't think women see it that way. I think the women, I'm telling you from their point of view, they think these are my kids. In our society, <laughs> it used to be, no, it's true. Like, it used to be that men had... Um, more say over their children, right. even in the earlier part of the century. But as the rules changed in the favor of women, now women are seen, are seen as sort of almost the owners of the children. And I think that, that what happens with men when they get divorced is a lot of times they just see the men, they see the women and the children as just a subset. And they say, okay, I don't want to deal with that anymore. But it's still their children. Yeah. And I think women tend to use kids because it's an easy way. You use the children and the courts, like you said, are going to tend to believe the mother, but they don't always. And I think people are getting a little bit more wise to some of the things that women are doing. Nice. I'm glad to hear that. Another yeah. thing I realize is that, and that might be changing too, is that people don't realize that when fathers lose their, their children, they mm -hmm. hurt from that. It really just emotionally it destroys, it destroys the father when they lose their children. You know, it really does. People don't understand how important children are. And I think that's one reason that men are afraid a little bit more of fatherhood because they know that, that if something happens to their marriage, that those children that they love so much can be taken from them yeah. in a way that I think mothers feel a lot freer that, oh, I'm probably going to get my kids. Right. So I think that's one reason women tend to divorce. 70% of divorces are initiated by women. And I think it's because they feel like, well, you know what, I'm going to get my kids. And they're just, I think fathers are just more reluctant to break off because they want to be in their kids' lives. And it really affects boys and girls when they lose their fathers because kids love both parents. So if they don't have their fathers in their lives, it affects them in so many different ways. Women You're look so for love. Men lose their way as to how to be a man. And so much happens when the fathers are taken away from the children. 
you're a hundred percent right about that. People don't realize they've done studies and they find how important fathers are. I worked in juvenile court and I know a lot of the kids that had so many problems, they were much, much more likely not to have a dad. Yeah. And I think that father hunger for, for children is, um, can definitely end up with them getting in trouble more in school. Girls can be more promiscuous. Uh, boys get in much more trouble. Yeah. I think dads are a huge influence and uh, we, we underestimate them very much. For 30 years, I've been, I work with all men but around the world, but I've been saying to black men that racism is not your problem. It's mm -hmm. not the problem. It has nothing to do with white people. It has everything to do with not having a father and a mother together, setting that good example for their sons and daughters to see how to earn their way in life, how to treat people. You treat others the way you would like to be treated. I grew up under the Jim Crow law in Alabama on a plantation, and we were taught to treat all people the same because we knew that it was a spiritual issue. It has nothing to do with the color. And, and we knew that not all white people agree with Jim Crow because we ran into them. We knew them. We would see them in town and around. So we treated all the same. And as a result, we were raised to work hard, to buy land, to get married, to start a family, to give back to the country. But now this cry is about racism and they're trying to white privilege and, and systemic racism, all these dumb things that doesn't exist, first of all. And I'm saying what they need is a home life. They need examples in the home, and they wouldn't have these problems in America. But they keep pushing racism, which is really, really not about that at all. So how can we get the intention of people to let them know it's about the family, it's the father and the mother, and nothing to do with all this other stuff that they're claiming is holding people back? I think part of it is from, it's kind of blackmail because what we have is we have a, a government system that pays people who are single parents yeah. more welfare money. And so as you know, more and more um, African-American uh, women have children out of wedlock and 36%, I think of all uh, black Americans are, don't get, ever get married. Yeah. So there is just not a lot of marriage and not a lot of incentive if you think about it to have that family unit anymore. And I believe that's uh, for uh, actually a political reason. It it's is. done because they're trying to destroy the American family, particularly the African-American family, because then you would be an independent unit that maybe wouldn't need these handouts from the government. Yeah, I literally know women who call up the men when their kids get a certain age, they mm -hmm. call up men, their ex-boyfriend or something to make another baby with so that they can continue to get more money from the government. It, it, I, I, I can tell you truckloads of women who are right. doing that. And, and sometimes the men would go and do it just for the sex or whatever. They would do it in the black community. Right. I well, want, I, I want to ask you about the suicide rate for men. It's going okay. up. And why is that? Well, the suicide rate, they only do uh, look at it every two years, which tells you how important it, it is. Yes. Um, in 2018, there were 48,344 suicides. Out of that, almost 80% of those were men, meaning that 39,000 men killed themselves in 2018. Wow. Um, we have more and more middle-aged men, those men between, say, 40 and 60, killing themselves. And the reason for that is when you look at the research, they generally find those middle-aged men kill themselves because of a problem with, the, uh, with their partner, which we're having more and more divorce, more and more men are affected. The other reason is financial and the other reason is legal. So we have more men who are low wage earners. The male wage has just plummeted. Uh, more and more men are working lower wage jobs. Um, their businesses, a lot of times, particularly with this COVID-19, I'm here in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I know we've seen um, a big spike in suicide because I think a lot of it is that a lot of the businesses are failing. A lot of men have depression. Yeah. And as a psychologist, I realized the importance of men getting mental health treatment. And they're really, I think, um, I think men are reluctant to do that. Yeah. And I also think that the therapists and the mental health workers are not prepared or really have an understanding of what men are going through. Should men, that's a sad commentary. When I was growing up, I never heard of a man committing suicide. It was unheard of. Men wow. just, you know, 
they dealt with things. They were able to overcome issues. When I first came to California, from Alabama to California, like going from an empty space to a busy city, and I went through a lot, but because I was taught by example to deal with things, I, there was no way I would take my life. I tried to do it one time because I was in love with a girl, I thought, and mm -hmm. we were going to break up, and I felt like I lost my God. But other than that, I dealt with issues in life. I, I can't imagine men killing themselves over issues in life. I think a lot of men suffer now from depression, and I think there really isn't any help out there. And our society is very callous towards men. The only message most men hear in the world is that they're a bumbling buffoon. The TV shows are full of idiot men. Commercials yeah. show men as buffoons. The society is against them. All they hear about is what idiots men are. You saw that even this man was afraid to speak up at the Trump rally to say he believed maybe a man should go to the Supreme Court. Right. I mean, even this is, I mean, this is his opinion. Whatever he believes it to be, he's afraid to say it. Yeah. In the United States of America, as a man, you can't speak up. I interviewed this, um, a really interesting guy from my book. His name was Carnell Smith. And he said that it used to be that um, race was sort of, you know, slavery in America. And now it's gender, that male, the male gender it has more of a slave state. And it's because men are now subjugated to the law and to women. And nobody really believes it, except the, the men who go through, say, the yeah. courts or, you know, the men maybe that you or I talk to. But most men think that they're exempt from that until they end up in a bad situation. Yeah. Um, do you do most Americans realize that men are in a crisis situation now? Yes, absolutely. Whenever you talk to women about their sons, a lot of them come up to me. Uh, people always ask me, what's your, the reaction of women to your book? And I think it's very positive in that they'll say, you know, my son um, is having all these problems at work or wherever, and I don't really know what to do. And I really don't know how to get help for him because, you know, the schools treat boys as if they're some kind of defective girls. Yeah. They're supposed to sit in their seat and take Ritalin or do whatever to keep themselves just under control. And we have a whole society built more for girls. Not that most women or girls want to sit around like that either. Right. The, I think the whole system is just geared towards um, not really treating people as individuals in a sense. I wanted to ask you, a lot of men go to female uh, counselors or mm -hmm. therapy, therapists and things like that. And the, the female tend to weaken them even more so by encouraging them to be more submissive or pay more attention to the woman, give her a lot more. And yeah. <laughs> that, that's just making the problem worse. Yeah, right. So what do you say to men about going to those type of female counselors? Well, I would say... A man or a woman counselor might be able to help, but I would be wary because 93% of all psychologists, not therapists, but psychologists tend to be liberal. And those people who are liberal tend to be more likely to have these sorts of issues where they don't really understand where men are coming from. Yeah. That said, I think as on an individual level that it, it's, if a man feels that he needs a psychologist, maybe to interview one, two, or three and see if there might be a better fit. And if you see the therapist acting in that way, acting like you're supposed to be submissive or, you know, if they don't listen and you don't feel they're empathetic to your, to your situation, then it's fine to switch. But I do think it's a little bit more difficult. And I wish there were more um, men and women who were trained in men's issues, but yeah. I don't know if we're going to see that in the universities because they're so biased themselves that if, you know, everything's about women are superior. And so I, it, I just don't know if that's going to happen. Yeah, I believe that because I know that concerning the universities, a lot of men are deciding not to even bother to go to colleges or universities because everything is so geared toward the woman. It's just boring to them and they don't want to be bothered with that. They don't want to be bothered. It's really unfortunate because I think there are some things at college you don't want to have uh, a dream and, and that be your dream to go to college or to learn something specific that you need for college. But 
uh, I think men is getting to where it's 60, almost 60% women going only 40% men. And I think you're right. I think men are very turned off by the female dominated atmosphere. Basically you go to school and you're basically told as a man, you're a rapist, you're, you know, responsible for women not being safe on campus. By the time you finish, you're like, well, I've already been abused at this school and they're making me pay 40 or $50,000 for the privilege of, of hearing this. I mean, I can understand that. Um, I think it would be great if there were more schools like Hillsdale or other programs yeah. that are, you know, they have um, a lot less of that. So it might be a good thing if you want to go to college to look into schools like maybe George Mason or other schools, places like FIRE, uh, which is an organization, they rank schools on how conservative or liberal they are or how much free speech they have. So that might be a good, um, you know, good to evaluate the college you go to just to make sure that it's not so female dominated. You said that most people, or at least, unless I heard you wrong, a lot of people are realizing that there's a crisis in America concerning men. Am I right about that? You are, yes. Why is there more of a dialogue about it? Why is the focus just not on rebuilding families, rebuilding men, to bring back that order so that kids can have a chance in life? Well, I think women have feel that they've gone so far, and I don't think we're going to go back to that because women are over 50% of the population and yeah. those votes are going to go. And those votes by the beta type males are going to go to <laughs> Democrats and people who can support those views. Remember the family, the goal here for a lot of the liberal, super liberals, I mean, far left is basically a socialist or you know a far left society. And that society doesn't include family units because family units can easily they're more independent and they make more money and they're more sufficient, efficient. And they, I think it's better if they feel that it's, it's a broken system. Yeah. And if you have a broken system, those people are more dependent on the government. Look, women are now using the government as their husband and that's yeah. what is wanted. You got to understand that's what, that's the idea of it. And they, many people, I think most people are fooled by that. And I think most women tend to be very, I'm stereotyping, but they tend to be more collectivist. They tend to uh, sort of be more in that socialist mindset. So I don't know that you're going to see a huge change. I think the change will have to come from men. And you see that yes. with, um, I think we, I saw that you wanted to talk about a little bit about men going their own way. And yes. I think you're seeing that now with men just saying, that, you know, men, there's a whole movement, men going their own way. Right. And, they're, and they're, those men are doing something about it. They're saying, you know what, I'm done with this. I'm not getting married or I'm divorced. I'm not going to, they don't sit around uh, just trying to live their life through women. They actually have lots of hobbies. They go out, they buy that land you were talking about. <laughs> they're, they're getting motorcycles. They're having a good time and right. they're enjoying life without having to deal with the stress of the women and the society that tells them they're all rapists or, you know, have to <laughs> have a woman in their life. Should they go their own way or should they be a man but yet deal with women in the right way, the way a man should? Because women need men. They need that. Uh, what do you, let me ask you then, what do men need? Men need that too because the average man is instilled in them to want a family, you know, right. to want to get back. Because once you buy the houses and the motorcycles and things like that, eventually you want to settle down and, want, and start a family. But if you don't deal with women in the proper way, the way a man should, I mean, you're not going to end up with the family that you want. So should they do both, deal with the woman and have a motorcycle? Oh, yeah, I think so. The problem with, I think, for men today is that they, um, I think they're afraid sometimes, they're afraid of conflict with women. So I think I absolutely agree. And what I would do is I would say that, yes, most men, and, you know, we're stereotyping a little bit here. I think there are a lot of really good women out there. There, there, there are, are some, absolutely. You know, and I think what you have to do is you have to try to find those women and you have to put, you have to open your eyes. Um, if you're a man and you really want a family, I think you've got to look for that woman who is a good fit for you. And most of all, a woman who has respect for you and you see that she has respect for your space and your um you know, like she cares about you and she provides a lot of respect mostly. And I think men tend to let women say things and get away with it now because they're taught not to talk back. 
they don't say anything. And then finally they just either blow up or just become depressed. And that's unfortunate. I see that a lot now. And I think what you're saying, when you say be a man, you're saying deal with women. Don't let a woman run over you. In other words, stand up and say, this isn't acceptable to me. You need to change your behavior or we're going to have to split up. That's right. I encourage men to deal with everybody the same, men and women. Be honest, speak up, set a good standard, and just treat women, because women are not special. It's not like they're like gods or something, you know? They're human beings. So if you're going to be, if you're going to treat a man fairly, you should treat a woman fairly, you should treat a child fairly, you should just treat everybody the same the way you would like to be treated, but don't put them in a special category. Yeah, I would say don't put women up on a pedestal. Right. (laughs) We're just people, and I think you have to treat them as people, but I think in our society, we've decided to sort of put women up on this kind of pedestal. And it's sort of this weird dynamic where women are sort of seen as up here, but at the same time, they have to have a man. And it's just, um, I think that that's really hard. But I agree. I think that you should, if you treat someone as a human being and they're treating you the same way, I think you can make a relationship work. I think the other problem in our society is things like Tinder and the way people meet now. It can be okay. It's a good way to meet. But I think people tend to think everybody's replaceable. So they're not, they're seeing them more as an object. Both men and women see each other as objects. And I think that's a really negative thing. You know, I talk about that. It's so strange to me to order a woman from the internet. It's like ordering a meal. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I like to run into it. You know, you're out in the public. You're going to work, you're going to church, you're going to the bar, wherever. You, you meet people that way, and right away you can kind of see if this is the kind of person I want to talk to again, or blah, 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 right? But when you order a woman or a man from the Internet, you really don't know what you're getting, especially with the transgender thing happening now and all that. It just seems strange that you could order a person from the Internet. <laughs> I don't know that people are ordering some for the internet. Yeah, that's what it seems like. But I think it's a good way for people to meet who are in a similar area or something. And I think one of the big things that we as we don't have all these communities anymore. Right. Um, you, you struck a, an important thing is that most people don't go to church anymore. We're very secular, you know, much more secular than we used to be. And if people aren't meeting in church and they're not meeting, maybe they don't want to go to a bar and meet. Uh, it's really hard sometimes to meet people because, and a lot of people work now, of course, everybody's working from home, but even before it's like, I think it's just a lot harder to meet people because we're just not around as many people as, uh, you know, because there's just a lack of community. Yeah. My producer just told me my time is running out. So I got to ask some fast questions. Number one, uh, I want to ask about incels. Are you familiar with incels? Yes. And for those who don't know, it's involuntary celibate. These guys don't want to be celibate, but for whatever reason, they're afraid or they whatever, they won't get involved with women. What do you say to the incel guys? Well, the incels, I think it's a really sad situation because these are people, these are men who feel that women really don't want them. And then at the same time, I think they have a lot of frustration and anger about it. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that bothers me is a lot of these men do, are, use derogatory terms about themselves, like they call themselves subhuman. Right. They see a society that is treating men. I think what's happened is, there's sort of this 2080 rule. It says that 80, 20% of men get 80% of the women want 20% of the men. So there's these men up here who get all the women. And then there's a bunch of subsets of men, say 50% that women really don't want. And that's getting more and more true in our society because fewer and fewer men are making as much money. The number one thing women want in a man, according to like the Pew Research Studies, is they want a man who has a financially good income and can support a family. And a lot of these men can't do that. So now the society is telling them, hey, you're not good enough. And then they tell themselves they're not good enough. I would say to those men, stop thinking of yourselves as subhuman and think of yourselves, like you said, as a human being. And I think all you need is one person who's different. And there are there sometimes there are people and you have to keep searching if you really want you know, to be with someone yeah. and rather than looking at it in this derogatory way. And the other thing is change your attitude about women. I mean, if you feel like they're all horrible, that's <laughs> unfortunate, but just pray that there's one or two good ones out there and you'll probably, you might, you might find one. Yes.
when you're dating, should men and women have sex before marriage? Um, you know, I'm a libertarian. So my thing would be, hey, you do what you want to do. <laughs> um, other people feel differently. And, yeah. it, you know, you have to respect that. It's like people who are religious or who feel that that's not right for them. I, you know, it depends on your value system. I notice that men and women who have sex have become like a, a, a drug. They become emotionally addicted to one another and mm -hmm. they lose sight of getting to know one another. And if it doesn't work out, you're able to walk away from it without mm -hmm. being so emotionally traumatized by it. Because mm -hmm. when you have sex, the men become like sex addicts and women become sex dealers. And it's hard to break up because your mind makes you think, Oh, he or she going to be with another woman, or he's going to be with he going to be with another woman, she's going to be with another man. You start imagining all that, but if you don't have sex before marriage, you won't get into all the what's going to happen. It's not so hard to break up. Well, maybe that would be a reason if you're in a relationship, maybe to get to know the person and get. I think we people don't get to know each other, and I think that's one reason people end up in really bad situations. Yes. They don't, you know, they have sex the first time. Next thing you know, you've got a crazy person on your hands that you didn't know. Yeah. So I would say spend more time getting to know the person, and you know, finding out more about them, and and maybe like you're saying, develop a deeper relationship if that's what you want. I think in our society, sex is freely available to some people, not to everyone. And I think um, I think that people sort of, you know, and, and I don't think it necessarily has to be a, a bad thing. Sex is a natural and normal thing for men and women. And, you know, it, it's normal. And um, I think, though, you don't want to use it as some kind of weapon. And it sounds like that's what you're saying is that sometimes it can be used as, as yes. a weapon. It's so bad, Doctor, that men and women meet at McDonald's. The, the, the woman can be working at McDonald's, the man go in and get some chili fries, and they'll meet, and they'll go over to the kitchen and have sex or in the bathroom, and now they're dating, and it doesn't work out, so they end up wanting to kill each other. It's just everybody and their mama having sex now. It's the first thing they do. It's like smoking pot. They have sex right away, and so they never really get to know each other. Well, again, I guess you're going back to that people see each other as a little bit more disposable. And I think you're right. I think it draws people in. And But again, I think it's more the emotional connection, yes. too, that people are getting upset about. I think people, when our, our society always tells you you have to find this one perfect person, and then when things don't work out, I think people feel that somehow they're a loser or they're, you know, but I think if you just, if people just tell themselves, you know, okay, it's a situation that didn't work out. But the other thing, going back to how you said you were, grew up, you grew up with parents and people who taught you how to be a fighter, taught you how to yes. deal with problems. Today's nobody teaches anybody how to deal with anything from the government to people's families. Nobody learns how to deal with problems. And I think because we as a society don't understand how to deal when things are really bad and don't understand to do, how to deal with hardship, I think when people get in a relationship and they don't know how to handle a breakup yes. because they've never handled anything that hard. You're right. You know, I could go on and on and on and on and on with you, but we're still out of time. So I, okay. So <laughs> I got to put you on the hot seat, though. I got to heat this thing oh, up. Okay. So I need you to answer these questions as quickly as possible. I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> the hot seat. Is today America a major archer or patriarch society? A matriarchy. Uh, are the Kardashian a good influence on America? The Kardashians? Yes. They work hard. Should sex be saved for marriage? I'm a libertarian. I, <laughs> I have to say go for it, but other people feel differently. Using just one word, describe Joe Biden. Woof. <laughs> Is it racist for white people to celebrate their heritage? No. Did you know that I started White History Month? I did because I saw a video where you said that and people looked very upset, particularly the one professor you were talking to. <laughs> it's I think amazing. She was Indian and she was mad. Oh, yeah. And so I decided July would be White History Month because July just feels white. You know, summertime, vacation, 
People relaxing. Doesn't that just feel white? I don't know. I don't like identity <laughs> politics, but, you know. Is there a deadbeat dad epidemic, or is that no. a lie? No, we have deadbeat moms. They don't pay up either, and they're even worse than the deadbeat dads. People you, just say deadbeat dad because it's a li- it sounds good. Yeah. Do you believe in Jesus? I'm a Jew. I'm Jewish. You Jewish? I'm Jewish. You don't look Jewish. Oh, okay. Oh. My last name's Smith, so nobody ever knows. But right. I'm you look like a white lady. Oh no, I'm not a white lady. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> you women. Be- <laughs> you look like. Did you say she was a white lady? No. Y'all knew she was Jewish. See, no. they, they wow, that's amazing. So you could be amongst people who don't like Jews and they're like talking about the Jews. Oh, and- yeah. No, that happened to me once. I had this woman from Oprah. She was uh, working with Oprah Magazine once and I took her up. I had done a film years ago and I was taking her up to do a shoot. And this woman started talking about Palestine and how the Jews were a bunch of shitheads and stuff. <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, I'm Jewish and I don't appreciate that. And she almost died. Wow. Maybe yeah. you should wear a little. Yeah, I have a star, David. I should start putting it on. But actually, I really like the way people talk when they don't know you're listening. I know. I love that. Yeah. So did I ask you women be in politics? Should women be in politics? Yes. Of course. Uh, do you love the great white hope? Uh, do I love Trump? Yes. Uh, Yes, I do. I've loved him from way before he got elected. I read The Art of the Deal years ago, and I think he's very courageous. And yes. just the way he spends his day, he's amazing. He is amazing. It's exactly is. what we need right now. He's exactly what we need. Amazing. You know, I wanted to ask you, because I'm out of time, just give me one or two examples. And I want the people to read your book. But give us, I know you, in your book, in the back, you have solution to the men issues. Are you able to tell us a couple of solutions real fast? Well, I think you touched on one of them. That was men need to speak up. There is a dialogue going on, and you are part of the equation. And I think men need to speak up about gender. It doesn't belong to women. It belongs to you. And when men don't speak up, the culture is taken over by women. Tell the folks how to get your book, how to get to your website, or whatever you're promoting. Thanks. Well, you can get my book, Men on Strike, and you can get it at Amazon. It's available in audio, book, uh, paperback, whatever you want to get. I think it's a couple of different languages. Um, You can also reach me. I have a Facebook community page, uh, Helen Smith PhD. You can find me there and you can keep up with what I'm doing. Um, And I would love to share this video when when it comes out. Right on. So you were born in California. Were you raised in Kentucky? No, I'm in Tennessee, and we came here, um, we moved here when I was three and a half years old, and I grew up here. I only lived in New York for graduate school when I was in my 20s, but I basically consider myself from Knoxville. Yeah, I grew up here. That's amazing, because it's interesting. You are a Jewish woman who looked like a white woman who sound like a Southerner. (laughs) I know, people find me really weird. (laughs) So Maybe that's why... like different kinds of issues. I think when you are, have a, a bigger uh, sense of the world through the different things that you are, I think you have a wider range of interests. And I think that's one reason like the men's issues or outside issues uh, sort of interest me. Yes. Well, thank you so much. I've totally sure. enjoyed talking to you. And I hope we can, talking to you. we can do it again. Maybe one day we can do a men and women conference or something, you know? Absolutely. Really deal with these issues. And so thank you for the book. Thank you for speaking up. And thanks for coming on with me. Thank you. All right. God bless you. You too. Thank you all for tuning in. I absolutely appreciate it. Don't forget to like, follow, tweet, share, subscribe, ring the bell, and check out our merch. We have some amazing merch coming up for you. We're going to be promoting that soon. But check out the store, and we thank you for your Patreon support. Have a good day. We're on the the Fallen State set, but we have to do it this way because of the uh, Chinese virus situation. So you're going to see a little more of this, and sometimes we're going to have people in studio. But let me hear from you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doctor. I appreciate you. Oh, thank you. It was wonderful talking to you. Uh, It was great. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Next time on The Fallen State. How have you been dealing with the Chinese virus? 
don't think it's proper to call it the Chinese virus. It actually came from Europe, from, from Europeans. What the? Christianity does not occur in a cultural vacuum. If you find a culturally neutral Christianity, that's just white Christianity pretending to be culturally neutral. Is Black Lives Matter a peaceful organization? Yes. Is Antifa a peaceful organization? Antifa is not an organization at all. During the protest where you had all the burning, the vandalism. That's not a protest. Those, those that was were, a terrorist those, attack. Those were white supremacist groups pretending to be Antifa. As associate dean, I, I managed uh, the work of about 100 faculty and the education needs of about 5,000 students. You're a mess. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>watching the fallen state we need your continued support donate to my non-profit here subscribe and like the videos here and tell everybody and their mama about the show